Today we're going to talk about Jensen's Alpha. And so this is an important concept when you are analyzing investment managers, portfolio manager, managers in the investment management industry. You often hear the term Jensen's Alpha or actually just the word Alpha. And people associate the word Alpha with just how much excess return a portfolio manager can make, you know, how much return over a benchmark. Well, the reality is, is that Jensen's Alpha isn't that simple. It's how much return a manager can make in excess of the risks that they are taking. So that's not just the index that they're managing against, but it's how much risk are they actually taking. So we're going to control for the amount of risk a manager is taking and then estimate, given that, what's the excess return. So, you know, the way to do this, if real th thinking about real simply, the capital asset pricing model, I think a lot of people who have studied finance, they come across this at some point in your finance uh, career. The cap M is simply states that the expected return on any asset can be expressed as the sum of the risk-free rate plus what's called the market risk premium here. This is the expected return of the market minus the risk-free rate. Okay, And then you multiply that difference times beta, the beta, and that's just how much your asset moves up and down with the market over time. So, so you know, this will be the same for every firm. The risk-free rate and the market premium is the same for every firm, so the only thing that's different is the beta. The beta is the only thing that differentiates returns from one another, according to this theory of the capital asset pricing model. And so, you know, if you want to look at it every single period, you know, you could, you could say, well, if I just move this R risk-free rate over to the left-hand side of this equation, then I basically say the excess return of my portfolio minus the risk-free rate should equal, and let's just skip this term right here, should just equal, and so it's basically just this stuff here. We've moved RF over here, so it's just, it should equal the beta of my asset during that period, period, um, during this time period, times the expected return of the market during that specific period minus the risk-free rate over the, that specific period. So, you know, the, all this is really doing is moving the RF to this side. And you look at this, and so this alpha number should be zero, right? Uh, we've just sort of thrown this number in there as the constant in this equation, and, you know, it should be zero. And if markets are efficient, you know, and if markets are efficient, then managers on average shouldn't be able to add value, at least not consistently consistently over and above the market. So the alpha should be zero. So we can test that. You can you can analyze a mutual fund manager or you can man, uh, analyze a certain type of an investment strategy by simply running a regression over time. You take the historical returns and you regress it against the right-hand side, which is the difference between the market return and the risk-free rate. So you, so you regress your <laughs> excess return over the risk-free rate minus the market's return over the excess uh, risk-free rate. And then the beta will be the beta, but then you're looking to see if this alpha number is zero. Okay, so that's how you would test it. And so let me just show you how that's done in practice. So I've got a portfolio all loaded up here. It just goes, you know, about three and a half, maybe four years almost from 2014. Actually, it's longer than that. Sorry, 2014 through 2021, uh, September. So it's May of 2014 through September of 2021. So you're looking at, you know, seven plus years here. Um, so I've got the portfolios returned. These are actual returns from an actual active manager. These are the treasury bill rates. And this, these, you can see they're so small. Uh, you've been in a period of quantitative easing and whatnot. The treasury bill rate is the annual rate divided by 12. Because again, we're using monthly returns. So I need monthly T-bill rates, uh, if you want to think about it in that way. In that way. And I've got the S&P 400. So this particular manager is benchmarked against the S&P 400. I've also got the S&P 400 value, and I'm going to use that to see if there are any style biases, which I can explain in a minute. Uh, so what I do is i got to set up the regression. And in Excel, you got to get everything kind of in contiguous columns. So here I've got the portfolio return minus the treasury bill rate. So that's just column, D, or column C minus column D right here. You can see that. Uh, then I've got the S&P 400 minus the T-bill rate. So the S&P 400 is the mid-cap index. So I've got that, and you can see that here. That's column E minus column D. And then, uh, you know, I've also got this the value index minus the S&P 400 to see if there's a style bias. I'll explain that 
in my second regression. So real quick, let's go ahead and run this regression. I'm just going to regress this column H against this column I. Okay, And so to do that, you just go into data up here. You hit data analysis for a regression. You can kind of scroll down and you will see that regression is one of your options. So you hit OK. And then this little pop-up box comes up, asks you, asks you for some input. So I'll put the input range here. So I'll just select cell H2. I'll hit Control Shift Down Arrow. That selects that entire field uh, of numbers. Then I click into the input my X range. This is the right hand side of my regression. And the right hand side, so I scroll back up and I put my cursor in I2. And I hit Control Shift Down Arrow. And now it selects all of that data. Then for my output range, I've got to click in that box first. I can either export it to a different worksheet or just find a place in my Excel spreadsheet where I want to dump the data. So I'm just going to choose, you know, let's call it cell M5 here. Okay, and then let's just go ahead and let it rip. Hit OK, and boom, you get your output. Awesome. High R squared. Uh, that means that this is a highly explanatory variable. I'm regressing my excess returns against the market excess, excess returns. So you expect a lot of correlation there. Here are the coefficients. This is my x variable, 0.81. That's like my beta. Call it 0.82. So this is a low beta strategy. So either the manager is holding a lot of cash or maybe they're just picking low beta stocks you know, for whatever reason. That is statistically significant. You're looking for a number greater than two here. That is a big time number. So it is very statistically significant. So the market, if when it goes up and down, this strategy is going to go up and down over time. The intercept is interesting. It's 0 0.0016, call it 0 0.0017. That means every month controlling for the market, controlling for the market, this fund is actually at, uh, up an additional 17 basis points per month. That actually, you know, amounts to a fair amount of excess return. You're talking something probably close to 2% per year. However, the T statistic on that is pretty low. So there's a lot of uncertainty around that number. And so it's really statistically indistinguishable from zero. You know, if you want to um, think about it that terms, this manager has probably added value over the market, um, at least controlling for the volatility of the market over time. But that alpha um, coefficient is uncertain, so it's indistinguishable from zero. So, uh, you know, the other thing that I would like to do is, you know, here's the thing. You go back to the cap M, and some people say, well, sometimes we find certain st strategies like momentum strategies what, and whatnot that have, that give you positive alpha. So we may have the wrong model of market equilibrium. It may be that they, that market is efficient, but maybe the cap M is a bogus you know, pricing model. Maybe we don't live in a cap M world. Maybe there's other risk factors that we haven't accounted for. And so one of them that was proposed by Eugene Fama and Kenneth, Kenneth French many years ago is, is basically valuation. You know, they called it the book to mark fa factor, but you know, how cheap stocks are relative to other stocks. If you simply buy really inexpensive stocks, you tend to outperform. So what they've got is a market a book to market factor that they use on the right hand side of their regression. I've kind of created a proxy for that here, a real poor proxy in fact. I'm using the S&P 400 value index minus the S&P 400. So, you know, this is a market neutral portfolio. You know, it's a, it is a proxy for a valuation bias. And so, you know, it's appropriate to look at it for this investment manager cuz they're investing within the S&P 400. So, let's go let's go ahead and check that out. So basically, I just want to run one more regression here, and then I'll get you out of here. But let's hit data analysis. Let's hit regression. And uh, so I'm going to keep my Y input the same. The same. I'm just going to regress my portfolio excess returns, which is on the left-hand side of that equation. But the x-axis, I'm actually going to broaden that out now. Okay. So before, I was only regressing against the S&P um, 400 minus the T-bill rate. This time I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do the second factor, which is kind of a value premium. And and so I just want to see, you know, do does my portfolio have a value bias or not, and and how does that impact returns? Now I knew, I want to stick it down here, the output. So I'm going to choose M, you know, 25. Now I'm going to hit OK, and you'll see a little bit larger regression here. Now you're going to see two coefficients. So this is that 
initial one, that sort of that beta coefficient, it's changed marginally. It's now 0.85, but it's for all intents and purposes about the same number as before. It was 0.82 before. So this manager, again, is running a beta of about 0.8, somewhere between 0.8 and 0.85. And, um, you know, so maybe they're holding cash again, or maybe they're just buying low beta stocks. They have a negative uh, loading on that second regressor variable and a, and a statistically significant t-stat. So negative on value minus growth minus the S&P 400. So what does that mean? It means when the value index outperforms the S&P 400, let's say it outperforms it by 1% on a given day or given month, then this strategy would underperform by 35 basis points on that day. Conversely, if the S&P 400 outperformed the value index on a certain day, then this strategy would outperform by 35 basis points on, I keep saying day on that month. This is monthly data. So what we're saying what we're saying here is that this strategy this manager actually has a slight growth bias. They tend to do better when the growth market outperforms the value market with the S&P 400. So it has a little bit of a style bias. When I account for that the style bias you can see that the intercept goes down from 0.0017 to 0.0011 call it and so you know marginally declines but nothing's great and again it's still not statistically significant uh, overall this seems like in an era where active managers have done poorly you know given that I'm getting at least positive intercepts if they're not statistically significant this seems to be a reasonably skilled manager <laughs> perhaps maybe they're lucky who knows um, but they they have not underperformed um, and if anything perhaps they've outperformed and that's basically the Jensen's Alpha the Jensen's Alpha is really first running against the market return minus the risk-free rate and checking for that alpha term that intercept term and looking to see if it's statistically significant um, researchers in the 70s and 80s and beyond started to add more factors value premiums, size premiums, even momentum premiums on the right hand side of the regression to look to see if additional strategies still had alpha once you threw those other factors on top of it. Um, but that's how you do Jensen's alpha. You know, traditionally just think about it using the cap M regression. Um, the CFA, you know, follows that methodology as well. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, and feel free to subscribe to the video because I make videos over time to make finance fun for students.